This is Living Power with Dan Hurst. The second denial, the second time, remember, was the denial of fellowship. And that was the time when Jesus said, I, I don't have anything to do with him. I, I, I'm not one of them. I'm not one of those guys. It was denying fellowship with Christ. And Jesus says, again, in John chapter 21, verse 16, Jesus says, a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he says, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Again, that very same word, you know intimately, intensely. You know my heart of hearts, God, and you know that I really do love you, even though I've messed up. And this time, Jesus says to him, tend my sheep. Now, once again, uh, Jesus asks him if he loves him. Peter responds in the same way. But this time, as he's addressing the second denial by Peter, which was the denial of fellowship, Jesus challenges and commissions him, essentially, to seek greater fellowship, specifically with the sheep, God's people, the flock. His church. Really, if you want to get down technical, what he was saying was instead of tend my sheep, he was saying tend my church. Tend my church. Now, it may be the local church or it may be the church, you know, the universal church. But the point is that God says, I have something I want you to do. I want you to fellowship. I want you to fellowship. I want you to tend. And in tending to them, the word and the grammar that Jesus uses here suggests that he was telling Peter to care for, guide, and protect my sheep. I want you to care for, guide, and protect my people. That's what we're supposed to do for each other. It's a calling in our life to care for, to tend, to guide, to protect each other. That is something that we fail so miserably at doing. One of my biggest concerns, and you've heard me say this before, and I say it over and over and over again, I am deeply concerned for women in the church because we tend to just, especially women who don't have husbands, we tend to just include them, okay, they're, you know, they're just part of us, but we need to be taking care of women without Husbands, we need to be caring for them. We need to. I mean, the Bible teaches that. The Bible says this. This is what the Bible says. True religion is this, says in James. True religion is this, to care for the widow. And the word widow doesn't mean one whose husband has died. It means one who is without a husband. And so we need to care for the widows and the children. That's something that we need to be careful about. That's what we need to be doing in the world today. And by the way, if we're doing that in the world today, don't you know that that's going to send a message to the rest of the world? One of the reasons that we have inequality in the world today is because the church has failed in that area. Because we don't take care of those who need to be cared for the most. And we need to protect, guide. We need to, we need to, to uh, embrace the whole concept that our responsibility is to care for those who need that. And so what Jesus was saying is tend to, tend to this, care for, guide, and protect your brothers and sisters in Christ. And the charge from Jesus requires a faithful vigilance over something that is important to God. When God says, tend my sheep, he's saying, this is important to me, Peter. And he's saying the same thing to us. Tend my sheep because it's important to me. My sheep, my people, my followers. That's important to me, so tend to them. We need to care for each other and love each other and protect each other and guide each other. We have that same calling. As a matter of fact, Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 and 25 says this, and let us consider how to stir up one another, and a lot of us just put a period there because we're Baptist. Yeah, I'm all about stirring up. But it says, and let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good work. By the way, I got an email um, a few months ago from somebody who listened to one of something that I had said on, on online. By the way, you got to be careful. You know, we have over a thousand videos online now of this class. It's amazing. And, uh, you know, and the thing I like about it is that after the rapture comes and we're gone, those videos will stick around, assuming YouTube is still on. I don't know. But in any, in any case, uh, I, I had said something about, you know, and, and you know how I am. And somebody wrote to me and they said, don't you like Baptists? 
They were really up. And I thought, of everything that I was teaching and that's what you picked up on? Come on. No, it's, it's not that I don't like Baptists. It's the deacons that I have a problem with. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I love it. We have some deacons in this class, and God bless them. I'm glad they're here. Spies. I'm kidding. You know I am. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. That's what we're to be doing. We're to stir up one another to love and good works. That's what we're to be doing. In other words, motivating each other to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Is the day drawing near? You bet. All the more reason why we need fellowship with each other. All the more reason that we need to be very, very careful that we are connected and we are meeting each other. The day is coming, and it's moving rather quickly in America well, we're not going to be allowed to meet. That day is coming. That day is coming. We need to take advantage of the time that we have now to embrace each other in the Lord and to, and to speak and, and encourage each other. Now, today, more than ever, the world needs the church. But we also need the church. We need each other. We need to think about what we're supposed to be doing. Now, here's what I, I want to I want to do something very, very important here very quickly. I want you to look, for those of you, for, if you're at a table, real quickly look at everybody sitting at your table. Just I want you to see who is sitting at your table. So, uh, get it in your mind. You know who's at your table. If you're sitting on a row of chairs in the back, look up and down your row and see who's sitting on that row of, of chairs. If you're sitting in a chair somewhere. All right, if you're, I don't see anybody who's sitting at a table by themselves, but if you're just, if there's only one or two, maybe look at another table and, and look at those folks also, because I'm going to ask you something really important here. You got it in your mind, who's all at your table or who's on that row of chairs there? And I want you to ask yourself this question. Go through each person sitting at your table. Think, you don't have to look at them when you're doing this, but just think right now in your head, you've looked at them, you know who's there. Go through each person sitting at your table or on your row of chairs and ask this question Do it for each person sitting at your table. Ask this question to yourself. Who is praying faithfully for that person? Go ahead and do that. Think of the people at your table, people sitting on that row of chairs. Who, each one of them individually, and just ask this question to yourself. Who is praying faithfully? For that person. I can tell you, I can tell you that there are some folks in this class who have no one praying for them on a regular basis. Because they may not have family members who are real believers. They may pray for them occasionally, but faithfully praying for them all the time. There are people in this class who don't have someone who will pray for them like that. They don't have a family member or a close friend that is lifting them up before the Lord. They really have no one really praying for them. Is one of those people sitting at your table or on your row of chairs? If God lays that on your heart, you need to start praying for that person. You don't need to tell them. You can if you want to. But the point is that you start praying for that person individually. I, I learned to do this several years ago. God just started laying some people on my heart that I started think. I mean, I thought about this. Who does that person have to pray for them? And, and when it really struck me that I couldn't think of anybody that would really be praying for this person on a regular basis, that it became my responsibility. And they became part of my routine, my daily prayer time, praying for those individuals. And there are some people that I'm still praying for, it's been years. There are some people where God's come back and said, all right, I'm releasing you from praying for that person every day now. And it's because God's put somebody in their life. And he's put somebody else in, on my heart that I need to be praying for. And there's not just one or two, there's several that God does that for. And 
we need to be lifting each other up. It's, there are people in this class that aren't being prayed for. That's not right. We need to be praying for each other. We need to be lifting each other before the Lord. And so think about those people, and maybe it's somebody not at your table, somebody else that the Lord lays on your heart, and you think, who would be praying for that person on a regular basis? And decide that it's going to be you. Tend to the sheep of God's flock. On behalf of Dan Hurst and the Open Class, we want to thank you for watching. We hope it was a blessing.